Part 7, Missouri Irish, A History of the Irish in America, by Michael C. O'Loughlin. Copyright 2010, from the Irish Roots Cafe and irishroots.com. Chapter 5, The Irish Wilderness. The Irish Wilderness and the Travels of Rev. J. J. Hogan. The Irish Wilderness debate has been one of conservation versus development in the 1980s. Through these debates, the Irish heritage of Missouri has been brought into the public eye. It is therefore worthy to explain just what the Irish wilderness was. The wilderness was founded by the Rev. J. J. Hogan, who served portions of northern and southern Missouri. Hogan left a detailed account of his experiences in his book, On the Mission in Missouri, printed in 1892. We will highlight some of his experiences herein. The famine immigrants survived starvation in Ireland and the voyage to America. Upon arrival, poverty, discrimination, and cholera were their new foes. Ireland, by 1854, was recovering from the famine, and immigrants were continuing to arrive in America. Hogan was serving the mission of St. John's Church in St. Louis. Composed of Irish immigrants, some 300 Irish Catholic servant girls regularly attended church services. The young men, however, were living the transient life of the railroad workers. Hogan described the situation in his own words, quote, not finding work in the cities, and there being no work for them on the farms in competition with slave labor, they were obliged to seek work on the railroads and to move from place to place practically debarring them from marriage of whatever sort. The Cary Patch in St. Louis held the majority of the newer Irish arrivals in town. The times were rough for the Irish and German immigrants of the city, particularly if they were Catholic. Jobs were scarce, and prejudice existed towards the immigrant groups. The famine immigrants had docked in St. Louis, lying on deck, dying from cholera. The cholera epidemic of 1849 did nothing to improve their lot in the minds of the local residents. In the years which Hogan served St. John's, 1854 to 1855, the worst riot in the history of the city broke out. It was focused against the Irish and German Catholic immigrants. The anti-Catholic and immigrant sentiment had surfaced more than a decade earlier and continued until the end of the Civil War. In June of 1857, Archbishop Kenrick accepted Hogan's resignation from St. Michael's Parish, appointing the Reverend Fian as a replacement. Hogan could now finally travel to the interior of Missouri, where the people were without church or priest. Concerned with the lifestyle of the Irish immigrants, he was determined to see the young men and women of St. Louis form stable relationships with their peers. The itinerant life of the railroad crews hindered proper family development, courtship, and marriage. Hogan found an alternative to the railroad shanties, alleys, and cellars to which the poor Irish were confined. He searched for a settlement where the new Americans could live in a healthy, stable environment. Land, he estimated, would cost about $1 an acre. Exploring several possibilities, he settled in 1858 along Ten Mile Creek in southeast Missouri. Adjoining land, however, had already been purchased, so he moved about 40 miles west to the permanent site of the Irish wilderness. Contained today in the Mark Twain National Forest, it comprised parts of Oregon and Ripley counties. The Irish names Hogan brought with him were numerous, for example, Sullivan, O'Brien, McNamara, and Griffin. The area ran along the tributaries of the Current and Eleven Point Rivers, about 20 miles north of Arkansas. By the spring of 1859, just prior to the Civil War, 40 families were settled east and west of the Current River. Most of the existing settlers in the area had come from Tennessee and North Carolina. Wilderness Lifestyle The wilderness settlement was self-supporting. Pasture was plentiful for the cattle. There was abundant oak and hardwood trees for building and burning, 
game for food, clothing, and shoes, and fish in the streams. The homestead land sold for 12.5 cents per acre and soon became productive. As hoped, marriages took place in the new settlement. A dowry usually consisted of a one-room log house. The groom received a yoke of oxen and a plow. The bride received a stealth of homespun dress fabric and the like. Getting Acquainted Settlers had arrived in the region prior to Hogan's settlement. Many knew that their families had been Irish Catholic and were driven from Ireland in the past. They were no longer Catholic due primarily to the lack of any religious facilities of that denomination on the frontier. Some could offer no reason at all for the religious change. Some of them once again became Catholic, others remained as they were. This points out one of the difficulties involved when tracing your Irish ancestors. Religious affiliation was never engraved in stone. Man's need for God was. Well on its way to becoming a thriving community, the Civil War brought an abrupt turnabout. Ripley County was overrun by Confederate and Federal troops. Marauders, bushwhackers, and murderers preyed upon the area during the war. The original chapel and most of the houses were destroyed. Most of the Irish went with the Union forces. Some went with the South. The crops had been destroyed. Patrick Griffin and his wife stayed on, but nearly starved to death. Two or three families returned after the war, but the settlement never recovered from this devastation. Father Hogan sadly wrote of the wilderness settlement, quote, Who now will build up these waste places? Who now will lead back the scattered settlers to their humble but ruined homes? Who now will rekindle for them the light of faith or preach the word of God to them in their little chapel beneath the pines in the forest? The original pine forest was cut down in 1885. In more modern times, lumber operations covered the area and conservationists rallied to the aid of Missouri's wilderness. It is now contained in the Fristo unit of the Mark Twain National Forest, a part of the current Eleven Point and Jack's Fork River areas, an area of natural beauty today. Father Hogan's own description of the area gives us a good idea of the original settlement. Quote, on a wide and fair tract of ground, bought and donated by Rev. James Fox of Old Mines, Missouri, a one-story log house 40 feet square was erected and partitioned into two apartments, one for a chapel and the other for the priest's residence. Soon improvements went on apace, cutting down trees, splitting rails, burning brushwood, making fences, grubbing roots and stumps, building houses, digging wells, opening roads, breaking and plowing land, and sowing crops. Already in the spring of 1859, there were about 40 families on the newly acquired government lands or on improved farms purchased east and west of the current river in the counties of Ripley and Oregon, and many more were coming, so that the settlement was fairly striding toward final success. The little chapel amid the forest trees in the wilderness was well attended. Mass, sermon, catechism, confessions, devotions went on as in old congregations. The quiet solitariness of the place seemed to inspire devotion. Nowhere could the human soul so profoundly worship as in the depths of the leafy forest, beneath the swaying branches of the lofty oaks and pines, where solitude, and the heart of man united in praise and wonder of the great Creator." Unquote. The 1860 census of Oregon and Ripley counties, listed in the text, gives us a good list of some of the Irish-born who settled in the Irish wilderness. Settlers of the Irish Wilderness According to local accounts, the Irish workers of the Iron Mountain Railroad line formed the bulk of the wilderness settlers. Patrick Griffin was an employee of the Iron Mountain Railroad. He owned land in Ripley County, where the handy post office now stands, according to an article in the Post-Dispatch. 
He was one of the original settlers, and his son had joined the Confederate Army during the war. When the family returned after the war, the settlement had been destroyed. This surprised some who believed that since slaves were not found there, it would remain safe. A descendant of Griffin, Billy Griffin, and his son still lived in the wilderness area when the Post-Dispatch article appeared in the first half of this century. Other direct descendants reportedly lived in the area also. Before the settlers assumed possession of their land, an upsurge in mining and timbering activity took place in the Pilot Knob and Potosi area. Settlers gained employment there while waiting for word from the land office. A special land office opened at Potosi in response to the increased land applications being made. Uncle Billy Griffin In 1924, Alan Hinchy of Cape Girardeau published an article in his newspaper, The Community, referring to his uncle Billy Griffin. Billy was the son of Patrick Griffin, who was listed in the 1860 census of Ripley County. The whole family had been born in Ireland. Billy was said to have been born in 1845 and was 13 at the time of the settlement. Relying on local memories, Hinchy spoke of Hogan as, quote, a young Catholic priest who spent most of his time with those Irish people, unquote, when they were employed on the railroad. The article mistakenly stated that Hogan went to Washington to see the president in order to obtain the land. It was also stated that Hogan went to various camps collecting his people, taking them to the land office at Potosi. There they filed claims for land. Romantically, the story goes on to say that on a beautiful early summer's day, several hundred wagons began their journey across the mountains to the Irish wilderness. It is more likely that the settlement occurred in small groups, as Hogan related that there were only 40 families settled there by spring. What happened to the wilderness? In 1885, the original pine forests were cut down. Later, the Irish wilderness area was proposed as a site for a nuclear H-bomb plant. Others remembered and preserved its heritage. According to the Reverend Bernard Tempe, former pastor of St. Benedict's Parish at Donovan, Hogan's original church stood one mile west of the hamlet of Pine, Missouri. Local folks still refer to it as the Priest Field. There was no trace of the original log structure, but the stump of a pine tree stood at the exact spot which was considered the site of the church. The debate continues. The Travels of Rev. J. J. Hogan The travels of Rev. Hogan cover much territory and time in Missouri. Eventually, he became the first bishop of the St. Joseph Diocese. From his beginnings in St. Louis to his service in Kansas City, he spanned the width of the state from the Mississippi to the Missouri. We will briefly outline some of the events and Irish settlers which Rev. Hogan encountered in his travels. Upon applying for land on which to build the Irish wilderness, it was found that many other settlers already had the same idea. The following individuals had applied for land prior to Hogan's attempts and therefore altered the location of the settlement. April 15, 1858, Maurice O'Brien. April 30, 1858, James Murray, Dennis Sullivan, Dennis Hurley, Thomas Mulvihill, Michael Mara, Stephen McNamara, Patrick Griffin, Patrick Rowe. April 26, 1858, James Burke. After running into a number of other individuals who had already applied for his chosen lands, Hogan turned the land acquisition filing over entirely to A. and D. O'Brien, Agents, 38 Chestnut Street, St. Louis, Missouri. Mulholland and Murphy In 1857, on the line of the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad, two contractors and their crews stood ready for battle. Mulholland had 100 men on the east side of the Muscle Fork of the Cheriton River. Murphy stood on the west side with as many men. 
The wives and children of these men were huddled in fear at the side of each encampment. This was a good example of the conditions which led Hogan to seek an alternative to the railroad employment for the Irish immigrants. This was apparently a temporary dispute among the two Irishmen, for they soon dismissed as friends again. Gary Owen, near Breckenridge, was the camp of Billy Griffin and Shea. They were also railroad contractors from Madison, Indiana, working on the grade of the Hannibal and St. Joseph. Later, upon hearing a large racket, Hogan viewed an encampment of Hibernians in the woods by the Lamine River. Unknown to the Irishmen, trappers and hunters, known as Jaegers, were about to fire cannon and rifle upon the unsuspecting group. When the Jaegers from Boonville fired upon the camp, the Irishmen fled and all their supplies and drink were consumed. An event like this would have been more than an unpleasant surprise. An Irishman to have further contact with Hogan was one Patrick Toohey. He was a contractor on the railroad at Center Point and gave Hogan the loan of a horse there. Irish Brown had a large, well-improved farm and house at the head of Parson Creek, 18 miles northeast of Chillicothe. Brown was a native of Dublin, his wife of Kentucky. Hogan had spent two trips and several days trying to locate him. Everyone asked had heard of Irish Brown, but couldn't give proper directions. Settlers were complaining of a lack of contact with the church, particularly in North Missouri. Hogan instructed Father Scanlon of St. Joseph and Father James Murphy of Hannibal to minister outside of their normal districts. The Rev. T.D. O'Keefe and Rev. P. McEnemy set out from the barons in Cape Girardeau on similar missions. The priests of the day were often Irish. In September of 1857, Hogan began his mission in North Missouri. Due to the lack of religious facilities in the area, fewer than 12 Catholic families were noted. Three years later, the railroad would traverse the district, increasing the population. Many new settlers and railroad workers would be Irish. His regular areas of travel included Chillicothe, Macon City, Brookfield, Mexico, and Cameron, Missouri. Irish Catholic families would move to these cities as a result of his regular church services there. The names of many he ministered to follow in this section. The Phantom Town At his mission in Brookfield, Hogan said Mass at Mr. Patrick Landrigan's, Mr. James Toohey's, Patrick Toohey earlier lent Hogan a horse, and Mr. Patrick McGowan's residences. Patrick Toohey was James' brother and lost his fortune by investing in Thayer, Missouri, which became a phantom town. One of many who banked their hopes upon a particular town in the booming West, fortunes were lost regularly. Hogan continued to serve during the Civil War. Provost Marshal McKinstry of St. Louis gave Hogan a federal military pass. He went through picket lines at Mexico with the same. Hogan and other clergy were charged for refusing to take the loyalty oath after the Civil War. In 1865, a grand jury deliberated on the charges against Hogan. The court included George W. McMillan, Robert W. Culla, James Sullivan. A new jury convened with Jared McIrvin and Pleasant Odill. Witnesses to the decision were Michael O'Brien and Peter Markey. R.F. Dunn was clerk. Other Irish were involved in the case. From Brookfield, six men drafted a letter of support for Hogan. Patrick Toohey, James McCormick, John Curtin, William O'Neill, James Toohey, and Thomas Bresnahan did so on February 6, 1866. The loyalty oath was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. The Reverend John A. Cummings of Louisiana, Pike County, Missouri, was the Irish-American whose case was heard. The deputy sheriff of Chillicothe in 1865 was Drury McMillan, another Irishman in the law. 
In 1866, Hogan spoke of the eminent statesman and jurist James McFerrin of Gallatin, an ex-colonel of the Missouri U.S. Volunteers. In 1863, Hogan was at the home of James Mulholland in Charlatan County. Mulholland's daughter Catherine would marry James Shaughnessy. The following year, their daughter Elizabeth was born to the young couple. The war subsequently scattered them to Brookfield and St. Catharines and destroyed the Irish wilderness settlement. The America after the war was different. Irish immigrants had gained acceptance by trial of blood. Many citizens would relocate, traveling to new cities. Kansas City would show remarkable growth after the war with the second largest Irish-born population in the state. The following names were cited by Father Hogan in his travels. Father Hogan's Roll Call Quote, In my declining years, it is one of my greatest pleasures to call to mind each well-remembered name with the personal appearance and traits of character to each belonging, of boy or girl. Often, too, I follow them in their diverging pathways of life, so far as it is given to me to know their history. But alas, many of them have gone from us forever, to a better world as I trust, to hear their names called as I fondly hope from the Book of Life. The Roll Call Pocahontas Bell resides in Kansas City, married Z.A. Cooper, President, Citizens National Bank, Kansas City. Rebecca Bell resides in Kansas City, married George Lapsley, Merchant, Kansas City. Victor Bell resides in Kansas City, Capitalist, married Miss Lockridge. Nanny Preston resides in Trenton, Kentucky, conducts a young ladies' academy, married Professor Z. Vineyard. Jenny Preston died many years ago at Grassy Valley, Livingston County, Missouri. Mary Murray, Mother Mary William, Superior of Sisters of Mercy, Louisville, Kentucky, superintends a young ladies' academy and five parish schools in Louisville. John H. Sullivan, Superintendent, Memphis and Birmingham Railroad, resides at Memphis. Mary Catherine Dunn, Mother Mary Agnes, Superior Sisters of Mercy, 510 East 6th Street, Kansas City, Missouri. S.S. Sonder, Cowan Lumber Company, Kansas City, Missouri. C.I. Wapples, Kevill and Wapples, Furniture and Upholstery Merchants, Kansas City, Missouri. Charles H. Shirley, son of Major Shirley, Chillicothe, volunteered for the Union Army at the close of school in the summer of 1864, killed in battle at Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864. Nicholas Hayes died in Texas many years ago. Lucinda Manning resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. Cecilia Manning resides in Kansas City, married Henry McLean. William Turner, lawyer, married, resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. Lambert Manning resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. Margaret Carlin, married, resided at St. Louis in company with her husband, set out on a tour of Europe, fell sick, and died at Liverpool. Rose Carlin, married, resides at St. Louis. William Samuel resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. Robert Samuel, lawyer, married, resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. Alice Samuel, married, resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. Francis Tanner, married, resides at Chillicothe, Missouri. James Tanner lives on a farm near Chillicothe. Mary Leone Eels, married, lives at Sedalia, Missouri. John Eels lives at Sedalia, Missouri. John Moore died many years ago at Brookfield, Missouri. Margaret Moore, married, lives in Kansas. Augustine Tuey, telegraph operator at Omaha. Thomas Tuey, married, lives at Brookfield, Missouri. Lizzie Butcher died many years ago at St. Joseph, Missouri. Ellen Galvin, Sister of Humility of Mary, Ottumwa, Iowa. Mary King lives in St. Louis. Several additional pages of names from Chillicothe and Brookfield appear in the hard copy edition of this book. 
Irish American Development The presence of the Irish American was well established by 1880. The Irish of the Famine Era, 1845 to 1852, had given birth to a new generation. These succeeding generations became more successful and were recognized as Americans. Social acceptance had not come immediately for these Irish, but only as a result of their accomplishments. The immigrants were poverty-stricken by American standards, even if they were better off than many in Ireland. Slaves in the U.S. lived longer, ate better, in better living conditions on the whole than the peasant did in Ireland. The mortality rate on ships arriving during the famine rose as high as 20%. Slave ships had an estimated 9% mortality rate in the same century. Cellars, attics, and alleys were turned into homes. The Irish assumed jobs as unskilled workers and domestic servants in St. Louis, as well as in the East. Only one out of ten were said to have married outside of their ethnic group. In early Missouri, this may not have been the case, according to Ellis, who stated that intermarriage in frontier Missouri was relatively common. By 1860, just over 50 percent had intermarried. The Irish-American income and IQ remained slightly above the national average. Contrary to popular belief, the family size was that of the national average. Two unfortunate statistics remain significant, however. Each ethnic group has its own weaknesses. In both Ireland and America, the rate of alcoholism and schizophrenia remain high when compared with other groups. The role of the Irish-American in politics has generally been recognized. At the end of the 19th century, several major cities were literally run by the Irish political organizations. Of some notoriety was the Pendergast machine in Kansas City, which came to an end by 1940. San Francisco was politically controlled by the Irish at the turn of the century. At this time, nearly all of the police and fire departments in the cities were controlled by the Irish-American. Block voting had given the Irish political influence as early as the 1830s. Irish mayors became prominent in the 1800s in Boston at a time when they controlled the Tammany political machine in New York. Chicago, Buffalo, and Milwaukee had effective Irish political organization at that time as well. The strict hierarchy of the Irish organizations made individuals wait their proper turn for advancement. This was a trait of the Irish heritage. Some of the reasons why the Irish excelled politically follow. One, the Irish maintained identity as a group, or clannishness. Two, they arrived decades earlier than other immigrant groups. Three, they spoke English. Four, they had developed a political awareness and clandestine organizational experience in Ireland. Five, personal charm and fluency were valued by the Irish and were qualities which enhanced the politician. Six, they were good at accommodating conflicting interest. The personal charm and fluency of the Irish led them to excel in other fields. Politics, law, show business, journalism, labor movements, and the priesthood would become common fields of endeavor. In developing St. Louis, the Irish chose law, politics, and journalism often. This trait had been established prior to Missouri statehood in 1821. As is common for new or lower-class immigrant groups, Individuals often excel in the sporting world. The Irish certainly did so. In St. Louis, some non-Irish immigrants would actually change their names to Irish ones to receive a better recognition in sports. The Irish would relinquish many of their sporting endeavors, as well as their tenement housing, to newer groups arriving in America. Population Distribution, 1980 in the 1800s, more than half of the Irish were concentrated in four states, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. The number of Irishmen therein exceeded that of Ireland itself. The southern states held only 85,000 Irish, according to reports. 
Of those claiming Irish American heritage today, states west of the Mississippi are leaders. California ranks number one in the nation. Texas is fourth. Missouri ranks 11th. Washington is 17th, and Oregon ranks 28th. These figures are based upon the federal census of 1980. The 1980 census figures of Irish Americans by state are listed in the hard copy edition of this book. The appendix from the hard copy edition of this book shows extracts from the Aaron Benevolent Society, 1818, advertisements in the Missouri Gazette, the Missouri Republican, and the St. Louis Inquirer from 1808 onwards, Irish American firsts west of the Mississippi, genealogical tips on tracing your Irish ancestors, research aids in Missouri, and a bibliography. The updated appendix pages for the new edition of this work shows historic broadcasts on Missouri Irish, oldest Irish business in North America, original Clanna Aaron dancers circa 1982, the IACC Grand Opening, 1982, Parade Festivities Pictured, Champion Piper and Dancer, Coal Camp Parade, 2007, St. Louis Irish, 2007, Kansas City Irish, 2007, and the Epilogue. End of Part 7. Continue on to Part 8 of Missouri Irish. Copyright 2010 from the Irish Roots Cafe and irishroots.com.